Excitement was in the air and SpaceX delivered this week, launching Booster 11 and Ship 29 for SpaceX's fourth integrated flight test from Starbase, Texas. Still, even with that taking place, the construction of launch vehicles, the new office building, and another launch pad rolled on. Now let's dig into this week's update. Starting off this week on Friday morning, Ship 29 opened its aft flaps as SpaceX prepared for another full stack of the Flight 4 vehicles. That afternoon, the LR-11000 slewed around in preparation for its laydown ahead of the fourth integrated flight test. A little over a half hour later, the chopsticks were opened and Ship 29 was picked up by SPMTs. It was then maneuvered in between the chopsticks and staged for its lift onto Booster 11. As the Starship was on the move, the launch site heavy lift crawler crane began to lower its boom. Like we've seen in previous launches, SpaceX always lays down the boom to minimize the risk of damaging the expensive equipment. Once Ship 29 was parked in the lift position, Mechazilla lifted its arms up to the Flight 4 Starship's lifting points. At the same time, rounding out a busy stretch at the launch site, crews began to remove the letters on the Gateway to Mars sign. The curved wall is now in the way of the expansion of the launch complex, and it's likely that the sign will eventually be rebuilt on a new border wall. On Saturday morning, preparations were complete and Ship 29 was once again lifted off its transport stand by the chopsticks. The rocket was then placed back atop Booster 11, completing yet another full stack of the Flight 4 vehicles. With the stack completed again, the work platform on the end of the ship quick disconnect arm was extended to give workers access to clear the Starship's ports on their protective tape covering. Once the platform was retracted, the ship quick disconnect interface was opened, extended, and connected to Ship 29, once again tying it into Stage 0. That evening, Ship 29's transport stand was picked up and moved across the launch pad to the former Test Stand A area for storage. In the early hours of Sunday morning, Rover Camera took a good look inside of Mega Bay 2. We can see that SpaceX has installed several different levels of access platforms around the building's central work stand that will allow crews to work on different parts of the future starships. Several hours later, an SPMT arrived at the build site and was positioned under one of the two-point lifters outside of High Bay. A few hours later, the lifting jig was driven inside of High Bay. A few hours later, down at the launch site, a crane lifted a small excavator out of the vertical tank area of the orbital tank farm. This excavator was likely used to demolish the concrete pedestals that held the recently scrapped tanks. In the early hours of Monday morning, a concrete pump truck arrived and extended its boom at the office building construction site. The pump then set to work, placing the concrete for part of the floor slab of the building's second level. Later that same morning, new stairs and access platforms arrived at the ring yard gate at the build site. In short order, the delivery was backed out onto Highway 4 and then taken around to the other side of the Star Factory, likely to be taken inside of the building for installation. Around that same time, the two-point ship lifting jig was moved back out of High Bay on its stand after about a day inside the building. About a half an hour later, a new booster barrel section was rolled from the far side of Star Factory and out onto Highway 4 for a trip to the ring yard. Once there, the four-ring section of a booster LOX tank joined a previously delivered common dome section in the staging area outside of Mega Bay 1. Shortly after 9 o'clock that morning, the concrete pump truck had finished its day work on the second floor of the office building and was folded up for departure from the site. Around lunchtime, down at the launch site, another section of the Gateway to Mars wall toppled to make way for the development of Starship Second Stage Zero. That afternoon, venting was seen at the Massey Outpost as SpaceX prepared for testing. Shortly before 4 o'clock, propellant loading began for Ship 26 on the site's brand new static fire stand. Then, about 45 minutes later, the new flame bucket and trench were christened when Ship 26 performed the first ever static fire at the Massey Outpost. <laughs> 
Early Tuesday morning, a concrete pump truck once again rolled into the office building site and got right to work, pouring the second section of the second level floor slab. A few hours later at the launch site, Ship 29's transport stand was rolled back over to the base of the launch tower, indicating a D-stack was coming in the near future. Two hours after that, the work platform was retracted away from Ship 29 in preparation for it being disconnected from the ground systems. Back up the road at the build site, the two-point lifter was once again picked up by an SPMT and rolled into high bay as SpaceX continues work on the remaining V-1 Starship fleet. Back at the office site, the second floor concrete pour wrapped up just before 8 o'clock and the pump truck was packed up. About a half an hour later, the ship quick disconnect interface was detached from ship 29 and retracted back to its resting position. After that, the work platform was extended and crews returned to tape up the ports on ship 29. Back at the build site, a white ship stand was rolled into the ring yard gate on an SPMT and taken into high bay. Up the road at the Massey outpost, the can crusher cap was lifted by a crane and placed on top of the B14.1 test article. Around an hour and a half later, the ship quick disconnect arm was swung away from the tower in preparation for de-stacking operations. Then just before 10 a.m., ship 29 was lifted off booster 11, rotated over and lowered back down onto its transport stand. That afternoon, some bridge crane hardware was driven across the ring yard and into the star factory for installation. Although now mostly structurally complete, crews continue working to outfit the inside of the rocket factory. At that same time, Booster 15's common dome section was rolled into Mega Bay 1 as SpaceX began stacking operations on the next Super Heavy booster. Down at the launch site, a steady flow of tankers were cycling through the orbital tank farm's offload area, working to top off the commodity tanks before launch. Booster 15's four-ring liquid oxygen tank section that was staged in front of Mega Bay 1 joined the common dome section inside of the building a few hours later. Shortly after midnight on Wednesday, rover camera caught another bridge crane girder being delivered to the Star Factory for installation. Shortly after dawn on Wednesday, and just over 24 hours before the launch window opened for Flight 4, Starship 29 was lifted off of its transport stand for the final time. The ship was then raised up the tower, rotated over, and placed back onto Booster 11, ready for launch. Back at the build site, crews did some testing of the door on Mega Bay 2, lowering it briefly before opening it back up. About an hour later, Ship 29's now empty transport stand, as well as the temporary pressurization trailer, left the launch site and headed to Sanchez, clearing the launch site of equipment. That afternoon, while everyone was thinking about Flight 4, SpaceX was still looking ahead. What appears to be a steel-plated concrete form and embed for a corner of the next tower was delivered to the launch site and offloaded. These pieces seem to indicate that the steel cladding we saw added to the existing launch tower's base will instead be integrated into the new tower from the beginning. Back at the build site, an empty vacuum raptor stand was spotted being moved and staged outside the doorway to high bay. Less than an hour later, vacuum raptor number 390 appeared from between high bay and mega bay 1, and it was also staged outside of high bay. A few hours later, however, that same vacuum optimized raptor was picked back up and rolled back the way it came, having never gone inside of high bay. About an hour after that, a crane was seen lifting a vacuum raptor out of high bay after it was removed from Ship 30 for unknown reasons. Finally, early on Thursday morning, the road was closed as Booster 11 and Ship 29 prepared for their date with destiny. Around 7 o'clock, SpaceX began loading propellant into the Flight 4 vehicles. At 7.50, following a seemingly flawless countdown, Booster 11 lit its engines and began to climb into the Texas sky. One of the 33 Raptors on the rocket appeared to shut down just after ignition, but the remaining engines performed nominally and the stack continued through Max-Q and on to main engine cutoff. After Miko, the booster's center three engines continued to fire while the ship lit the engines and accelerated away. The booster then flipped, lit the remaining 10 inner engines, and performed a seemingly nominal boost back burn. 
Shortly after the burn completed, the hot staging ring was jettisoned, and a little over seven minutes into the flight, the booster fired the inner 13 engines again for its landing burn. One engine failed to light, but the remaining 12 did their job. The booster slowed significantly before reducing to just the center three engines for the final deceleration and soft splash down in the Gulf of Mexico. Meanwhile, the ship continued a nominal burn all the way to its planned suborbital trajectory and entered its coast phase. About 45 minutes after its T0, Starship 29 started to re-enter the atmosphere and we began to see plasma forming along its belly. Unlike the last launch, this time the ship re-entered in nominal orientation. The ship continued on through the expected period of maximum heating with little to no issues. By the 57 minute mark, plasma could be seen penetrating the hinge joints on both the rear and forward flaps. Once inside the forward flap, the plasma began to quickly eat away at it. Somehow, however, the flap managed to hang on and not only stay attached, but maintain functionality even with a large chunk of steel melted away. The ship maintained control all the way down, then flipped and performed a landing burn prior to the second soft splash down of the day. SpaceX entered the day with the main focus being to get good re-entry data of the Starship. By that criteria, the flight was a resounding success with both vehicles performing controlled landing maneuvers and soft splashdowns. Excitement was promised and it was definitely delivered. Around the time that Booster 11 was splashing down in the Gulf, the chopsticks also closed, possibly in a simulation of booster catching operations. Following the launch, first looks showed that Stage 0 appeared to hold up fairly well. The launch mount looked a bit toasted, but otherwise sound. The ship quick disconnect arm does appear once again to have taken some damage though. The support arms for the extendable interface seem to have been broken, similar to what we saw following flight two. This damage isn't surprising given that it ended up getting hit with a booster 11's plume. Over at the tank farm, by and large, the infrastructure itself appears to have held up very well. Some of the protective steel armor and insulation on some of the tanks, however, does look to have been blown off, although the equipment itself appears undamaged. Later, additional hardware for the next orbital launch tower was spotted being delivered to Starbase. Now, switching over to Florida, on Friday night, Falcon 9 Booster 1076 launched for the 14th time as it lit up the Florida skies for the Starlink Group 6-64 mission from Space Launch Complex 40. On Saturday morning, a barge arrived at Port Canaveral, headed to the Banana River and on toward the turning basin outside of NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building. This barge, like we have seen in the past, was here to pick up more hardware to transfer to Starbase. On Sunday afternoon, SPMTs brought the fifth section of the new Starbase launch tower and the chopsticks carriage to the turning basin ahead of their transport to Texas. The next morning, Tower Section 4 was also delivered to the dockside staging area. About four hours after that, the first of the chopsticks for this new tower rolled up to the staging area as well. It's worth noting that these arms are significantly shorter than the arms on the current launch tower at Starbase. Meanwhile, Just Read the Instructions was towed back out of Port Canaveral in preparation for the next Starlink mission. By mid-afternoon, the final component for the barge trip to Texas, the second of the chopstick arms, arrived at the Turning Basin dock. That evening, fairing recovery vessel Bob followed Just Read the Instructions out to sea for the Starlink G8-5 mission. Less than an hour later, SpaceX's other East Coast fairing recover vessel Doug arrived at Port Canaveral with both of the fairing halves from the Starlink Group 6-64 launch. On Monday morning, as crews began preparing to load the barge, two SPMTs were moved into position beneath the fifth section of the new tower. A few hours later, a shortfall of Gravitas was towed back into Port Canaveral with Falcon 9 Booster 1075 from the Starlink launch a few days earlier. First thing on Tuesday morning, crews at the Vehicle Assembly Building Turning Basin were ready to start loading. First up, the fifth tower section was rolled onto the barge, driven to the far end and set down. Meanwhile, at the port, Booster 1076 was lifted off the barge and placed onto the dockside stand. 
A few hours later, the carriage followed the tower section onto the barge. Once aboard, it was rotated 90 degrees to allow it to be placed as close as possible to the already lowered tower section. That afternoon, the final tower section was also loaded onto the barge. It was rolled forward between the arms of the carriage, once again keeping things tight to make room for the remaining components. A little less than two hours later, the first of the shorter chopsticks was rolled towards the barge. It was first rotated into the preferred loading orientation, then moved on board. That evening, Falcon 9 Booster 1067 turned the Florida night into day as it lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 for the Starlink Group 8-5 mission. On Wednesday morning, dockside processing was completed for Booster 1076 and it was lifted off the stand and laid onto an awaiting SPMT. A few hours later, Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams made history as the first humans to launch from Space Launch Complex 41 and the first to fly on Boeing Starliner capsule. The two took off in capsule Calypso atop an Atlas V rocket on their way to a rendezvous with the International Space Station. About an hour later, the second chopstick arm was transferred onto the barge, completing loading and leaving the crews to finish securing the various components in preparation for departure. Late that afternoon, a short fall of Gravitas was towed back out to sea in support for the next Starlink mission. On Thursday morning, as SpaceX was preparing for the Starship launch in Texas, the barge was moved off the dock in the turning basin. It then began the journey down the Banana River to Port Canaveral and eventually on to Brownsville. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Congratulations SpaceX on Flight 4, and guys, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.